welcome to Dune chapter by chapter. So this is the second half of uh, the chapter one episode. So the first part, I read the chapter. So now in here, I'm going to kind of discuss the chapter and talk about some ideas and stuff that are brought up in the chapter. So in this chapter, we're introduced to a few things. We're introduced to the idea that there was a great war against thinking machines and we're introduced to Castle Caladan, the planet Caladan, introduced to Paul and his mother and the Bene Gesserit. It's a lot of interesting things. And uh, so we're introduced to Paul and, you know, we're given the idea that he's someone special, but he's also someone that wasn't supposed to be. Uh, so the, the Bene Gesserit that are introduced in this book through uh, Gaius... Mohim, uh, Gaius Helen Mohim, she comes to test Paul, and she's not happy with Jessica, because the Bene Gesserit are, have been in control of this breeding program for thousands of years, and over this time they're trying to create the Quizax Haderach, which is basically a male Bene Gesserit, because they can only see down one path of uh, their genetic background. So the Bene Gesserit have the ability to access all the memories of all their ancestors that they're, you know, that they, uh, that they came from, from their ancestry. So like their mother, grandmother, great grandmother, all the way back, but they can only look back through the female side. So they kind of use this ability to help them solve current problems and stuff like that, but they can't look through the male side. So over time, they're trying to produ produce a male Bene Gesserit that could see through both sides. And um, now it's never really explained why the Bene Gesserit can't see through the masculine past in the book. Not to my knowledge anyway, but I kind of heard this explanation on uh, another YouTube channel, Comic Book Girl 19. She was talking about d the book Dune. And her reasoning was because uh, the female has the two X's, and but the male has the Y and the X. So they can only have like the female genes, so they they can't see back through. But the male has X and Y, so they can see through back male, masculine, and female. I haven't read that anywhere else. I'm seeing any routes, but kind of makes sense, I guess. Um, and their whole purpose of creating a Quizax Hatterack is so they can control him, and then they can have more power and more control. This is, Dune is all about people getting power, and all about grabbing more and more political power. And uh, so we're kind of told about Spice Melange, but we don't know its properties yet in this uh, book. And the, the guild is mentioned, the Spacing Guild, and it, they're secret. But how they actually function within the Imperium isn't really revealed yet. So the whole purpose, the, so the whole uh, scene around this chapter is this Bene Gesserit has come to test Paul. Because Jessica disobeyed the Bene Gesserit because she was supposed to have a daughter. So that daughter could be married to the Harkonnen heir, Fate. And then, then they could have the best of both those bloodlines. And then the next uh, child after that was going to be the Quizax Haderach. So Jessica disobeyed and had a son and really threw, threw off their plans. So they're not happy. <clears throat> so they're going to test him to see if he could be the Quizax Haderach, but he came one generation too early. So in the nature of the test is Paul has to put his hand in a box. And so the box is going to make it feel like his hand is burning off. So it's extremely painful to keep your hand in this box. But if you pull your hand out of the box, uh, the Bene Gesserit have a needle, you know, right on your neck that if you take your hand out of the box, they stab you in the neck with this needle and it has poison so strong that you're dead instantly. So keep your hand in the box and tolerate excruciating, unbearable pain of having your hand burnt off or die. So that's the, that's the nature of the test. So the reason for the test is explained that the Bene Gesserit want to separate humans from animals. Kind of give the um, analogy of sifting sand through a screen. So they sift humans through a screen and this is their screening process. So if your intellect can override your instincts and keep your hand in the box, you pass the test. But if your instincts override your need to escape the pain and you pull your hand out of the box, 
then you're too far on the animal side of the spectrum, I guess, and you die. So this is, so kind of made me think uh, about a few things, um, this chapter. Uh, I used to read like a lot of self-help books and stuff in, in, in the past. And that, but one of the things that they kind of had in common was the more mastery you had over your own emotions, the more of a successful person you would be. So I guess uh, to give an example, uh, I'll give this really simple one. So because um, it, it was kind of explained that humans are driven by two things. Uh, the ability are two things uh, of, to avoid pain, the need to avoid pain and gain pleasure. So everything you do, you're always trying to avoid pain, gain pleasure, avoid pain, gain pleasure. Um, so if you want to look at animals, animals are all driven by their instinct, but they're kind of driven by the same thing. But they have no intellect to override that, like humans do. So if an animal is hungry, it eats. Tired, it sleeps. Cold, it gets warm. You know, it doesn't think about anything else. It just whatever it's going on in the moment, it reacts to it. Where we're, we have the ability to, our intellect gives us to, the ability to override that. So if I'm hungry, I'm not, I, I can decide with my intellect, well, I'm not going to eat right now. I'll eat an hour later or later on I'm busy doing something else. Or like if an, an animal is, uh, wants to mate, it just goes and has sex. Uh, we're a human, uh, you know. If we want to have, we, we can't really do that. We can, we can use our intellect to override that. Hey, well, you know, I want to have sex, but I can't do it right now. Or there's no one to do it with, or you, you kind of get the idea. So, but humans have the ability, they can, you know, use that intellect to override all those, uh, I guess, base instincts. So that separates us. But the more, you know, the more, more of that ability you have, the more successful you're going to be. Because there's a lot of people in the world that don't have a lot of control over their emotions. So they're more reactive to everything than, I guess, they're more reactive than proactive to everything. And then uh, you, and then people have that ability to put up with pain if they think they're going to gain pleasure at the end of it where an animal doesn't. And there's an example kind of given of that in the book where it says, uh, like, if a human's got its leg trapped in a trap you know it will wait and hope that it can get out of the trap so it can seek revenge against that predator in the future and remove that threat from its kind but an animal can't do that it's just thinking about escape and the pain it's in in the moment so it'll gnaw its leg off and then escape but it won't think i should remove that predator so that my species isn't being hunted by it anymore so an example of having to put up with a pain to gain pleasure at the end. One would be, say, if you're in a mall and you see an attractive girl and you want to talk to her because you think you might get a date out of it. Well, depending on how, you know, if you have a lot of fear or you lack a lot of confidence, you know, that's going to impede your ability to do that. But the more control you have over your emotions and the more control you have over your intellect, if you can override all that and go up and talk to all these girls, then you're, you're going to have more dates than the guy who can't. So that's an example of, you know, the more mastery you have over your emotions, the more mastery you have over your intellect, you know, the more effective you're going to be in the world. Uh, same thing goes with another example is if you have a job you don't like, but, you know, you have to pay your bills. So now you have to go and put up with this pain to go work at a job you don't like so you can collect a paycheck so you can pay your bills and have money because even though you have to go through that pain you know you're going to get pleasure at the end of it because you're going to get money but also to avoid an even greater pain and that's like not paying your bills not paying your rent and getting evicted so that's what this chapter kind of made me think of so the so this would be the ultimate test of that so if you could pass that test if you had enough willpower to keep your hand in that box long enough and long enough to survive the test, then you have an extremely strong will, in my opinion. And so that's the measuring stick they use. But if you're too overrun by your own instincts and stuff like that, you're going to pull your hand out. So Paul passed the test. So that's a big sign that he may be the Quizax Hatterack. 
And then Paul's already shown uh, abilities of prescience, of being able to see into the future. Because he has dreams of uh, Arrakis and he has dreams of the, the water, that the one of the water caches that they have, you know, that they're stockpiling. And he already dreamt of uh, the Bene Gesserit coming to visit him. Things like that. And then we kind of get a glimpse of Bene Gesserit training because he puts himself in that trance to control his fears beforehand, you know, and to calm his body. So he has like this great control over his metabolism and all the cells. And um, that's like the ultimate level of control. The Bene Gesserit can control every cell in their body. And uh, so it's interesting. And then the other thing we kind of hear about is we're kind of set up the background of why this society is the way it is, why it's like low tech. It's more of an analog. Nobody has computers and they live in castles. It's a very feudal society, you know, kind of medieval society. And we hear about this great revolt is mentioned. And it's mentioned that, you know, thou shalt not make a machine in the image of a man, of a, of a person's mind. Uh, and it's mentioned that once humans had given up their ability to think to thinking machines, uh, they were enslaved by men with other machines. Now, this is an interesting idea because this is where uh, the Dune fandom kind of splits here. This is one of these ideas that's kind of debated online. And the split is caused by the Kevin Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson books. So I read the three books that make up the Machine Crusade, the Butlerian Jihad, the Machine Crusade, and the Battle at Corn. Uh, and that covers the Butlerian Jihad. And then I read the condensed version of the Butlerian Jihad in the Dune Encyclopedia. So the split is a lot of fans don't like the way that conflict was portrayed in uh, the Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson books. Now we don't, it doesn't really get mentioned much in this, uh, in Dune. But, uh, so you don't really know, you kind of, you don't really know what it was about. Uh, but a lot of fans feel that Brian, uh, Frank Herbert's original intention of the machine of the Butler and Jihad was more ideological. So in the, from what I gather, when I read on, uh, stuff I've read online and stuff I've read in the Frank, in the Dune encyclopedia is uh, that the Butler and Jihad was kicked off by, uh, this woman, Serena Butler. Now, her name is different, actually. In the, it, It's Serena Butler in the uh, Brian Herbert, Kevin J. Anderson Dune. Uh, but in the, it's her name is slightly different in the encyclopedia. I can't recall it right now off the top of my head, so I'll just refer to her as Serena Butler. In the encyclopedia version, her child is in a hospital and dies because a computer system decides that it's better to kill the child, makes that decision. And so it, could, it probably just came to that conclusion out of some pure logic. And then Serena Butler reacted extremely emotionally to it. And then that's what kicked off the jihad. But in that version, what it is, it's a group of humans going around and basically forcing other civilizations to give up their technology. So it, it puts the human, it, so it puts the people that are on the, on the, that are for the Butlerian Jihad, the people on the side of Serena Butler, puts them in a very bad light in the original version. Which maybe Brian Herbert then thought it would be more commercial that the way they did it, I guess. But this is a much more interesting idea, I think, if this is what Frank Herbert had. And I would strongly I would I would think this is probably what he had in mind for the uh, machine crusade. The crusade against the machines. This is an interesting idea that, you know, in a lot of ways, technology is like a double-edged sword. So technology can free us from a lot of things. Uh, like, a lot of people were lifted, uh, you know, like, like one technology that really changed the world was the ability to print. Like, the printer had a huge impact on society. There was all these people who couldn't read. And so it was left up to priests and all that to interpret a lot of things for them and read things for them. And that kept people down and kept people oppressed. But when the printing process came out and people had reading and just common folks could read, it had a huge impact. You know, you know, in information, people could figure things out for themselves more and then they could get caught. So it had a huge impact on society, the printing press. 
so, but, but there's always like a two-edged sword to uh, technology. So I, I think in, in this instance, the whole setup was that people had become, their, let their minds become extremely lazy because machines were doing everything for them. We can kind of see an example of that today in small ways. So an example to that, to, of that today would be, like, I have a cell phone. Everyone has a cell phone today. And so all the numbers of everyone I need to contact is in that cell phone. So I know my own cell phone number off by heart, and that's it. Now, when I was growing up, you know, no one had cell phones. They were around when I was growing up in the 80s, but not like they are today. Like, you, very few people had them. They were a very rare thing that people came across. Everyone had, like, a rotary phone or a cordless phone or something like that. But I can remember when I was a kid, all my friends, I knew all their phone numbers off by heart. So if I wanted to dial this person, I knew their number. I, I, I don't know any numbers now outside of my own. Uh, so that's an interesting, and a lot of people are like that. I've had that discussion with a lot of people like that. And a lot of people know that. Yeah, like nobody knows anyone's phone numbers now off by heart because it's the phone does it for you. The phone does the remembering for you. So in a small way, you're already giving up that little bit of you're letting your mind just get that little bit more lazy because the machine, the, the AI, is doing it for you. So that's that's like a small example. So now, now blow that up where we live in a society where we have super AI and it does everything for us. Like the, you know, we don't have to do anything. You know, all the infrastructure, all the manual labor, everything is done by machines. And what kind of impact that would have? So the way the way I s interpret that is humanity became so lazy that they couldn't do it without their thinking machines so they they were super dependent on them and so when the jihad was waged across all these planets so basically this army shows up and forced all these people to give up their thinking machines when they weren't when there was and there was no preparations put in place for it so they just came in there destroyed all the thinking machines moved on just left these planets there so you had all these people that spent all this time, hundreds of years, totally dependent on their thinking machines and their economy was dependent on it. So they all just died horrible deaths of starvation and disease and things like that. So then it doesn't put the character of Serena Butler in a good light. Now in the Brian Herbert, Kevin, Kevin J. Anderson version, it was basically like a Terminator nightmarish future where thinking machines physically oppressed humans, brutally oppressed them, and had them, you know, were being very sadistic and cruel to them. So it made it, like, very black and white. So then the people were who were on the side of the Butlerian Jihad were shown in a very heroic light. So you can see it's quite an interesting difference there. And I think, I think, uh, Brian Herbert, I don't think what Brian Herbert and them did was, uh, what Frank Herbert had intended. So, uh, because it was, it's, it doesn't kind of doesn't match a style like that's too like it's too black and white. Here are the bad guys. Here are the good guys. The machines are bad. And humans are good. Where in this way, it's more of like an ideological thing. It's like two ideas. One group of people thinks, okay, we got to get rid of machines because our minds are too lazy. And one group want to hang out on hang on to them because they're totally dependent on them now. Um, so this is the setup for Doom, because now you because of this. You know, people had regular governments, like elected governments, and once all the machines were done away with, you had these like feudal system take over. And uh, so, in the first chapter, uh, you know, you kind of get the idea of this. In the first chapter, we're in a feudal system, and uh, so now, now he has an excuse to have it uh, like low tech and all that, because uh, Brian Herbert set it up this way so he could better. Uh, examine like the political ideas and stuff he wanted to and the uh, sociological ideas and all that kind of thing he was talking about. And it's kind of interesting that uh, too, we're, we're Caladan is like a water planet. So we're introduced to this water planet and uh, Paul is getting set up. He's going to be the savior of this planet where they almost like worship water and like he came from a water planet. It's, that's interesting. So a lot of interesting ideas in this first chapter. Uh, and a lot of interesting things introduced. And then we're kind of hinted at that the Bene Gesserit know exactly who, well, they they do know who Paul's, you know, maternal grandmother, grandfather is on his mother's side. But the Bene Gesserit, they kind of hints, hint at it. And that gets revealed later on in the book. 
and uh, it's a very I think it's a very good chapter it really makes you think the more you read it you know it's like you can you can pick you almost get more out of it whole idea of like the sifting the humans from the true humans it's an interesting thing and then Paul and then the last thing I wanted to talk about that they get into this chapter is Paul has this what he calls his instinct for rightness because he can see something sinister about the Bene Gesserit they're looking at how they can use Paul, how they can control him to their own end games. You know, uh, if he is the quiz at Sadrat, will they be able to control him? And so he starts to realize that, you know, he senses there's some, he has some terrible purpose that he doesn't want to be a part of. That there's something, that, you know, that he, he's a tool for a terrible purpose. He himself is a terrible purpose. That the Bene Gesserit think that you know they think they're doing the right thing but really their their what their actions are going to lead to disastrous consequences in which it does all this breeding that they're doing and this whole plan they had gets this monkey wrench thrown into it and so they end up you know paying the price for it it leads to a very very bad thing as you see later on down the other novels and now Paul, we're getting foreshadowing of this, that Paul's is starting to see already in this first chapter that he has a very dark future ahead that he, he wants to try to avoid, but we all know he doesn't. So yeah, you know, really interesting introduction, really fascinating how Brian Herbert came up with the whole test and all that. And... Um, and uh, it's... Uh, yeah, it's an interesting. Uh, it's, it's going to be interesting too to see how this scene, because guaranteed the scene is going to be in the upcoming 2020 film. It's going to be interesting to see how this is done in the movie. We've seen two versions of it now with the 84 film, the 2000 miniseries. We're going to see like a third version of it. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. So a lot of inter interesting ideas in this chapter, in this first chapter. So I'll end it off right there. So that's everything I got to say in this video. Let me know what you think in the comment section and I will see you at the next one.